From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Brad Taylor, Johnny. Mid-States Industrial. Oh, hiya, Brad. Caught another chief accountant with his hand in the till? Nope. This is an old case, Johnny. Three weeks old, anyway. It's that Kansas City payroll stick-up. Uh-huh. We were right. There was a Jipper Nitson gang. How do you figure? Well, as you know, there's been an APB out on him, wanted for questioning ever since he disappeared the day after the holdup. Yeah, I know, Brad. He was recognized last night in Phoenix, Arizona. State Highway Police threw up roadblocks. They tagged him south of Tucson, just north of the Mexican border. They get him? If they had, I wouldn't be calling you. He shot his way clear, but they killed one of his boys, Ronnie Bledsoe. He'll never be missed. So Jipper's still on the loose, huh? Yep, along with that $100,000 payroll insured by us. I gotta get that money back, Johnny. All right, Brad. I'll fly out there and find it for you. Uh, but watch yourself. Every minute, those hoods are three-time killers. I thought it was two. Three now. They killed a state trooper at that roadblock. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Mid-States Industrial Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut... The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Primrose matter. Item one, $142.80. Incidentals in Hartford and transportation to Tucson, Arizona, where I checked into a hotel. Then I contacted the highway police and presented my credentials to Lieutenant Cal Mervin, who was directing the all-out search for the Nitson gang. Lieutenant Mervin had been at the roadblock. They call us flat-footed, Dollar. That's how they happened to get away with it. How do you mean, Lieutenant? We flashed the red light on them, and they slowed down and rolled up to us like they were going to stop. The car was a different make from the one they'd supposedly been seen in. We found later they'd stolen another one in Phoenix. I see. Then when we threw the spot on them, we saw just the one man, the driver. Turned out the others were down on the floor. How many were in the car? Four, apparently. Three afterward. I shot one of them. They threw his body out a half mile down the road. I may have hit another one. I'm not sure. That figures... I tip off from Kansas City named Jipper, Nitson, Ronnie Bledsoe, and two unidentified. Yeah, and Bledsoe's the one who was killed. Nitson and the other two got through. You said they slowed down as though they were going to stop. What happened? Oh, there's no excuse, Mr. Dollar. We were careless, that's all. Why don't you get so many false alarms, mistaken IDs? And to make a car, the whole setup, it didn't seem to fit. You can't be wound up ready to pitch all the time. Well, we paid for it, then with his life. I was luckier. I got off with this bullet burn on the side of my head. Hey, you never know. Check. Well, anyway, the boys on the floor of the car came up shooting. One of them with a Tommy gun. Hmm, they used the Tommy gun in the stick-up. That's how the two guards in the armored truck were killed. It's a rough weapon, Mr. Dollar. Ben dropped on the first burst from it. Didn't even know what hit him. I got this scratch from a pistol bullet. Saved my life, I guess. It flattened me before the Tommy gun picked me up. Then the driver slammed into second, and they skidded past on the shoulder. I hauled up my gun and emptied it at him before I passed out. Hitting that fellow Bledsoe was sheer luck. Any trace of them at all since they broke clear? No. They had a little luck themselves. As I said, I passed out, and it was 20 minutes before a car came along the highway. Or before one stopped, anyway. I think several probably passed, scared to get mixed up in something. Oh, that's understandable. And the fellow that picked me up took me 15 miles up the road to an emergency first aid station. All in all, it was over an hour before the report got to Highway Patrol headquarters and they could get new blocks set up. And Nitson and his boys could have covered a lot of ground by then. Sure, that's it. Here's a map of the southern Arizona area from here to the border. Mm -hmm. Here's where they hit us. We had the roadblock there at the junction. I see. From there south to the border, there's no through road branching off, just some dead enders. Or like the Arivaca Road that loop back and connect into the highway again. What about the border, Lieutenant? According to the Mexican customs officials at Nogales, the car didn't show up there. And I'm inclined to buy that. With the rear window shot full of bullet holes, it would have been pretty conspicuous. And as I understand it, it hasn't turned up anywhere else. No, nope, so far we haven't been able to find it. Of course, they had the advantage of an hour's head start. Well, that's it, Mr. Dollar. They could have doubled back. It could be in New Mexico, northern Arizona, California, a thousand places. On the other hand, though, they couldn't have known they'd have that hour's start. What do you mean? 
Well, they couldn't have known they'd killed your partner and left you unconscious. You were still shooting at them when they gunned away from that roadblock. All they could reasonably suppose was that you'd be reporting in by radio two minutes later. What are you getting at, Mr. Dollar? Well, if that's what they did suppose, then they wouldn't try any doubling back. And yet they didn't reach the border down here at Nogales. But there's no through road that connects into that 20-mile stretch of highway. All right, so maybe they're still bottled up right in that section. I don't see how. We've been over it half a dozen times. In cars, horseback, helicopter, we're still checking it. I'm just about ready to cross it off. Logic says that's the most probable place they'd be. Can logic find them, Mr. Dollar? It might, combined with a whole lot of luck. You got something in mind? Well, I don't know. I, I was wondering if a civilian, so to speak, might have a better chance of stumbling onto them. They'd be on the lookout for the official search parties. You being the civilian. Uh, that's what I sort of had in mind. They're pretty rough lads. Hey, tell me something. Do you get a lot of rock hounds around here, uh, amateur geologists, uranium hunters? <laughs> if you're not careful, they jump out from behind the cactus and stake a claim on your watch dial. Easterners, some of them, I suppose. Uh, tenderfeet, I guess you'd call them. Not some of them, most of them. Then one more wouldn't exactly create a sensation. No, he wouldn't even be noticed. Is that the angle you're thinking of? Unless you know a better one. No, it's not bad. Well, do you know where I can get fixed up with an outfit? Go to Dave Bright's Sporting Goods on South Stone Avenue. He'll give you that dude look about as cheap as anybody. Just tell him I sent you. All right. And um, don't get too far away from civilization, Mr. Dollar. Any special reason? Yeah. I may want to contact you to let you know the Nitsen gang's been picked up in Portland or in Butte, Montana. Maybe. But I wouldn't count on it. Expense account item two, $446.35 for a deluxe rockhound rig, complete from buckskin field boots to sleeping bag, snake bite serum, and a Geiger counter, and including five days' rental on a four wheel drive Jeep. With well, that kind of a get up, anybody'd have to find uranium just to break even. But at least I figured I was equipped for any possible eventuality, so I headed into the wilds. And the first spot I decided to prospect was around 20 miles north of the border, 50 yards back off the highway. It was known to the local inhabitants as Jake's Bar and Grill. The bar was a warped plank counter with rickety wooden stools. The grill seemed to consist of a rack of stale sandwiches wrapped in wax paper. But it looked as though Jake himself might be paid dirt. Uh, Howdy, stranger. What do you say? Save your money and buy beer. (laughs) That's a good idea, but... I think I'll have a scotch this time. Even better idea. <laughs> uh, have something yourself? Uh, you paying for it? Yeah, I might at that. Well, then I'll just have me a little of this foreign hooch. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, here's biting the rattlesnake. Check. Scotch. <laughs> well, you figuring to find yourself some of that there uh, uranium, are you? Yeah, I might. How'd you guess? Them duds you're wearing come from Dave Bright's place. Sunday mining clothes, we call them. Hey, no offense. Oh, I'm hard to offend. The name's Johnny Dollar, Mr. Uh... Jake Meager. Jake's enough, though. Everybody knows him for that. Been around here a long time. Oh, then you know this country pretty well, I imagine. Well, enough to tell you that if you find a fresh square foot, one where somebody ain't already been looking, then you're doing better than most tender feet. No, uh, no, no offense there. It's just a way of talking. Well, I, I guess you call this a vacation, too. I, I don't really care much whether I find anything or not. It's uh, just a chance to see some new country. Well, I reckon you could call some of this more or less new once you get away from that there highway. Oh, and how do you go about doing that? You mean by car, I guess. Uh, Easterners ain't much on walking. Well, I, I have one with a four-wheel drive. Get you a mile or two further, but that's about all. Only way to do it's on foot. <laughs> You're probably right. But I'd start by car, at least. <laughs> uh, which side road would I take if I wanted to get lost? Uh, around here, you mean? Yeah. Anywhere along the highway between the junction and the border. Well, as a matter of fact, you wouldn't have much choice. There are six, seven passable roads, but they don't lead no place except to ranches. Don't uh-huh. even get up in the foothills. You, uh, you ain't getting a mite dry again, are you? Mm. Oh, sure. Fun them both up again. <laughs> much obliged to you, Mr. Dollar. No, I'm asking. Yeah. Well, there'll always be an England, like the fellow says. Yeah. <coughs> oh, yeah, about them roads. Now, <coughs> the only one that might fit the bill for you is uh, Santa Rita Summit Road. <coughs> oh, I think I remember that on the map. Yeah, on the map. Well, 
It, uh, it leaves a highway about three miles down, then runs 14 miles back up into the Santa Rita mountain range. It doesn't connect on through? No, dead ends, a couple of miles past Primrose Camp. None of these here roads go no place. That's what I've been telling them state police for two days. They've been looking for some stick-up fellas. Be... I reckon you heard about that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I did. Why, them fellas would be out of their minds to take one of them there side roads. Ain't no place they could go to on them. Oh, it sounds logical, all right. You ask me. Them fellas jumped the border somehow. That's how come they was down here in this part of the country to begin with. Oh, you're probably right, Jake. Anyhow, uh, you think this summit road might get me off the beaten path, huh? Well, it's your best bet around here. It climbs up into the pines. Uh, It hit 6,000 feet at Primrose Camp. It's in good shape, too. Used to haul ore out over it a few years back. There are mines up in there? No, no, no. They're all worked out now. Oh, a few little high graders scratching for pennies. But the big stuff's gone, for the time being at least. Some folks figure it'll come back, but I ain't one of them. Well, what is this Primrose Camp? Pop Bardell's place, named after the old Primrose Mine. Yeah, but what is it? Well, mixture of things. Why, uh, Pop's probably been making more money there than he would if the mines did come back. He, he, he's he got a filling station and half a dozen flimsy tourist cabins, lunch counter that his missus runs, little grocery store and souvenir shop his daughter Jenny takes care of. Ooh, got a lot of things making income for him. Oh, what about customers with a place 14 miles up a dead end road? Well, he gets a few. Enough. Picnickers and tourists in the summertime, hunters in winter, oh. and fellows like you all year round <laughs> come looking for this uranium stuff. He ain't got much expense, neither. It's all in the family, you see. And now he's got a new hand to help, starting today. That's so? Yeah, yeah. He come down this afternoon to get the mail. Yeah, you see, the bus stops and drops it off here with me, and Pop comes down every day and picks it up. <laughs> I figure he likes a chance to get out of sight of the missus for an hour. <laughs> 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 Sent this boy today. Uh, this new hand he's taken on. Well, uh, not exactly a hand. He's Pop's nephew, so he said. Comes out of Tulsa yesterday. Oh, I see. Funny thing, though. He sure didn't have any Oklahoma accent. Uh, Jake, how old a boy is he? Well, hard to say. Between 25 and 30, maybe. A real close mouth sort of fella. Couldn't hardly get a word out of him. Uh-huh. Uh, nothing tall like Pop. Why, that old fella talk a leg off you if you go up there. Before you can open your mouth, he'll sell you a tank of gas, two quarts of oil you don't need, some genuine phony ore samples, and rent you a couple of them cabins of his. And... <laughs> well, thanks for the warning, Jake. I'll be ready for it. Well, uh, good luck, Mr. Dollar. Uh, whatever it is, you're uh, hunting. What do you mean? I've seen a lot of tenderfeet come hunting uranium, but you're the first one that wore a shoulder holster with a gun in it. Uh, uh, no offense, you understand. Johnny Dollar. Lieutenant Cal Mervin, Mr. Dollar, State Highway Police. They relayed your call to me. Good. I was just checking in, Lieutenant. You said to keep in touch in case I left civilization. Well, you haven't left it far. I recognize the number. Oh? You're at Jake's Bar and Grill on the Nogales Highway. Yep. You didn't need a uranium hunter's outfit to go prospecting in that little nugget. Well, I'm going up into the Santa Rita Mountains around Primrose Camp. You're playing a hunch or have you got a lead? Well, both. But at the moment, it's more hunch than lead. I just wanted you to know where to start looking in case I disappear. Now, look, Mr. Dollar, I've got every man on the force out now looking for that gang of killers and the $100,000 payroll they stole. If I have to add you to the list, that's about all I'll need. Relax, Lieutenant. If things work out, you may find us together. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Jake's Bar and Grill somewhere on a highway in southern Arizona... To the home office, Mid-States Industrial Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Primrose Matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item four, three dollars and sixty cents. To Jake Meager for information and incidental beverages. The Jibber Nitson gang had hijacked an armored truck in Kansas City and escaped with a hundred thousand dollar payroll. Two nights ago, they'd shot their way through a roadblock in southern Arizona, killed a state trooper, and left one of their own members dead in the road. Then the other three had simply disappeared. The information from Jake? 
that old Pomp Bardell operated a tourist camp and service station 14 miles up a dead-end road in the nearby mountains. And it seems that Pop had acquired a new nephew within the last 24 hours, a complete stranger to Jake. There was only one way to check it out. Drive up to Primrose Camp. Howdy. Hi, how are you? Uh, want me to fill up the tank? Yeah, might as well. Uh, probably won't take much, though. Hey, how much farther does the road go? Just a couple of miles. Oh, too bad. I was just starting to enjoy the scenery. Hey, you know, you're lucky living up here in the hills. Got some real pretty country around you here. Yeah. I thought I might spend a little time in it if I could find a place to stay. I guess there'll be some more tourist cabins on down the road. No, huh? no, these are the only ones. Oh, oh, well. Well, in that case, you got yourself a border. Huh? Took less than four gallons. Yeah, I figured it wasn't that much. Hate to get caught short, though, up here away from the highway. Now, uh, about that cabin. Oh, sorry, we're all full up. Oh? You, you'll, you'll find some places down on the highway. Well, there wouldn't be much point in that. I was planning to do some prospecting, get around a little on foot. This would be a good spot to work from. I, I, I've got no vacancies. How about the oil and water? Oh, yeah, you better take a look, I guess. Bad country for a tenderfoot. You get in a lot of trouble. Such as what? Uh, snake bite, get lost, fall off a cliff, a lot of things. <laughs> oh, I've been in a place or two before. Uh, best you forget it, son. Oil's all right. It's funny, those cabins look empty, no cars parked in front of they're, them. They're all rented. And the water's all right, too. Oh, well, they rented, too? Vacationers? Prospectors? They couldn't say. It'll be a dollar twenty-six. All right. Hardly worth stopping for. There you are. Keep the chance. Thanks. Call again. Yeah, yeah, maybe I will. When Pop Bardell gets by. I'm Pop Bardell. You can't be. You don't fit the description. What do you mean? Well, I was told Pop Bardell had started talking a leg off me before I even got my mouth open. That he'd not only sell me a tank of gas, but also two quarts of oil I didn't really need and a handful of fake ore samples and... Rent me a couple of cabins whether I was planning to stay or not. Who told you that? Jake Meager down at the highway. Oh, Jake. Jake's one talks too much. Maybe. Jake had an order Uncle. set. Uh, uh, well, what is it? Uh, nephew? You about through out there? I need a hand in here. Yeah, yeah, I'm all through. Oh, that the nephew Jake was telling me about? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's him. Oh, nice looking fella. Arrived yesterday unexpectedly, Jake tells me. Yeah, 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 that's, it, that's right. Comes from Tulsa, I understand. Tulsa? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, from Tulsa. Uncle! I'm coming! Well, now, I got just, some just... friends in Tulsa. I wonder if he might know. Where are you going? I want to say hello to you now. No, you can't go in there. Why not? Well, we're fumigating it. It just ain't safe. Oh, oh, all right, I won't go inside. But I want some cigarettes out of the machine. I'll get them for you. Just give me the quarter. You feel all right? Sure. Well, it seems to me you're kind of jumpy on edge. I thought all you Westerners were supposed to be relaxed and easy going. Now, look, you, you want them cigarettes. You have trouble, Uncle? No. No, no trouble. This fella just wants some cigarettes is all. What brand? Chesterides. There you are. Thanks. Oh, here, don't you want the money for him? You give it to my uncle here. Yeah, sure, here you go. Thank you. If that's all now... Say, uh, I understand you're from Tulsa. That's so? I got a good friend down there, Clem Welke. I uh, thought maybe you knew him. Afraid not. Look, if there's nothing else now, you... Been just... there about a year. He's working on that new electric plant they're building down there. But I guess he'll be out of a job before long, though. I understand they'll have the plant done by the end of the month. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's about finished. Now, look, mister... Surprise, you... you never met Clem. But Tulsa's a big town. Yeah, it's a big town. Come on, Uncle, let's get that stuff moved. Well, I guess I'll drift on down the road and sleep out tonight, maybe. I got my sleeping bag. Now, probably see on my way back, I guess. Yeah, you do that. There was only one thing wrong with the whole setup. To the best of my knowledge, there wasn't any new electric plant in Tulsa. I drove on past Primrose Camp two miles farther to the end of the road. It was narrow, unpaved, and for the most part bound by a straight drop-off on one side and a vertical cliff on the other. 
with no chance for a car to turn off. There were two fire roads for access by the Forest Service, actually nothing more than narrow trails. The turnoffs were blocked by steel cables padlocked between heavy metal posts. As far as I could tell, they hadn't been tampered with, and no car had turned into either of the trails for a month or more. It added up to one thing. There was simply no place in the area where the Nitsen gang's car could be hidden. Yet I was still certain that they were here, somewhere. An hour later, I'd left my car at the road and was lying on a rocky ridge 300 yards or so above Primrose Camp, watching the place through binoculars and seeing nothing of any importance. Two cars stopped. Sightseers, apparently. One driver had the water checked and left. A couple got out of the other car, spent 20 minutes in the lunchroom, came out and drove off. Pop Bardell came outside occasionally. His wife, too, a couple of times. But Bardell's daughter, whom Jake Meager had told me about, didn't show. Neither did the mysterious nephew. I kept on watching. Howdy, stranger. Hmm? Hunting something now, you? Oh, uh, no, no, not exactly. You look like you was. (laughs) I'm just admiring the view. A city fella, ain't you? Guess you can tell one every time, can't you? You can when you... I lived alone in the mountains as long as I have. Then them duds you're wearing, too. Got them at Dave Bright store, didn't you? That's right. Dave outfits a lot of you eastern fellas. Can always tell stuff that comes from Dave's. It's got a look about it. Hey, uh, you wouldn't be a prospector, would you? Forty years of it, son. You live up in these parts somewhere? A six mile across the canyons there. Got a cabin I built myself and some claims of mine. Ain't been there for three weeks, though. Oh, is that so? No, been prospecting over toward the Rincons. Heading back home now. You're the first living soul I've seen. You haven't heard any news, then, in the last three weeks? Who? Oh, my name's Johnny Dollar, by the way. Jed Marsh. Proud to know you, son. Howdy. Sized you up before I spoke to you and decided to take a chance. Mighty glad uh, to find you ain't a smart aleck like a lot of them city fellas. Oh, it takes all kinds to make a city, Mr. Marsh. I reckon so. Never could see why it takes some kind, so... Hmm... There's Pop Bardell out in front of the station. Usually step by and say howdy to him, but I reckon I'm going to pass it this time. Known Pop long? About 14 years now. Well, then you must know his family pretty well. Well, aside from his missus, there ain't no family, except their daughter, Jenny. No, I was thinking of his nephew in Tulsa. He ain't got no nephew, Mr. Tuller. Oh? I understood he had. He ain't got no living kin at all, except for some cousins in Virginia. Oh, I guess I was misinformed. Yep, that's for sure. Pop's a real lone wolf. Used to be a prospect himself years back, but he never really had the knack for it. Anyhow, he, he finally bought this here Primrose camp and settled down to a civilized way of living. I'd say he got about as far away from civilization as he could. A compromiser, that's what he is. Always fooling himself. I told him that a lot of times. Even keeps on prospecting off and on right around the camp there when he knows there ain't no pay dirt in this rock. <laughs> well, that's like a city man growing vegetables in a window box, I guess. Son, I wonder if I can ask a favor of you. Well, sure, what? I was aiming to go on down there and get Pop to do it, but I'll have to stay all evening if I do, and I'm kind of hankering to get home. Well, if it's anything I And, of I can... course, if I go to the authorities... They'll keep me around, asking questions, making statements. What are you talking about? If there'd been any signs of life, anything I could do to help, you understand? Mr. Marsh, what are you getting at? Well, over across the ridge there, in the bottom of the canyon, there's a car half buried under a rock slide. All right, easy, Mr. Marsh. We don't want to start the rest of that rock coming down. I've been moving rock all my life, son. Here we go. All right, it's clear. Let her go. Now, that's good. I can get the car door open now. Watch yourself, sir. They had it pretty well buried, all right. Who do you mean by they, Mr. Uh, Dollar? It doesn't matter at the moment. Give me a hand, will you? Let's get this guy out. That's fine. We'll lay him here on the side of the car. It's like I figured... Couldn't be anybody left alive after rolling all the way down that slope. This one wasn't alive before the car rolled down. What? He was shot by the state highway police. Mr. Dollar. They did a good job of hiding the car, temporarily at least. It couldn't have been seen from the air. The only way of finding it was to stumble onto it the way you did. 
And you ain't up here just for pleasure, are you, Mr. Dollar? I'm an insurance investigator. I'm after a stick-up gang who've killed two bank guards and a state highway trooper. This man was one of the gang. There ain't nobody else in the car here. Is he the gang? There were four of them to start with. This is the second one who's been shot to death. There are still two to go. Where you figure they are? At Primrose Camp. Johnny Dollar. Hello. 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 What's that? I, I can't quite hear you. This is Johnny Dollar. I'm phoning from a patrol phone, Forest Service, Summit Road. Okay, you're coming through now. Is that Lieutenant Mervyn? Right. I should have known it was you. What are you doing up there in the mountains? Is this a manhunt or a vacation? Relax, Lieutenant. Before you use some words, you'll have to eat. Meeting? Call in your APB. I found that stolen car the Nitsen gang was using. Where? Up here in the Santa Rita Mountains, about a mile from Primrose Camp, Pop Bardell. Yeah, yeah, I know the place. They ran it off a cliff and started a rock slide to bury it. One of them's still in the car, dead, two bullet wounds. You must have hit him when they crashed your roadblock. And that makes two dead. Leaves Chipper Nitsen and one other one still on the loose. All right, Mr. Dollar, I'll have 50 men combing that area within an hour and a half. You will not. I what? There's something wrong at Bardell's place. You bring 50 state troopers in here, you may bust it wide open. Bust what wide open? That's what I'm trying to find out. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Santa Rita National Forest, Southern Arizona. To the home office, Mid-States Industrial Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Primrose Matter. Expense account continued. It took a lot of arguing to get Lieutenant Mervyn of the State Highway Police to hold his men off for 24 hours, but he finally gave in. $100,000. That was the amount of the insured payroll the Nitsen gang had got away with in Kansas City, killing two guards in the process. Later, they shot their way through a roadblock in southern Arizona, left a state trooper and one of the gang dead in the road behind them, and then disappeared. I was certain the answer was at Primrose Camp. Evening, Mr. Bardell. Uh, something else you forgot? No, I told you I'd stop on the way back down. Got a vacancy yet on one of those cabins? They're all rented. Oh, that's too bad. I, I notice they're dark, by the way, and there are still no cars parked in front of them. It don't signify. Well, what do you suppose all your guests are? Lost back in the hills somewhere? Couldn't say. Now, if you... Maybe did... some of them went down to the highway for the night. I I could turn the cabin back over to them if they happen to show up. When they're rented, they're rented. Makes no difference if the folks ain't here to use them. Well, that's true, I suppose, technically, but... When a traveler's badly in need of a place for the night and you've got cabins standing empty... I told you before, it's better you go on down to the highways. Plenty of motels within a few miles of the junction. Well, that's exactly my trouble, Mr. Bardell. I can't. Why not? Because it's almost dark now and I haven't got any lights. What? Yeah, this is a rented car. I should have tried the headlights before I took it out, but I didn't. Now when I need them, they won't work. See? Uh, it's... Probably just a fuse blowed. Oh, might be. Let me turn the flashlight up under the dash here. It won't take but a second to tell. Is that what it is? Nope. Fuses seem to be all right. Broken wire, maybe. Hard to say. Oh, uh, think you might be able to fix it? No, no. It, it's a job for an electrician. I ain't got the equipment to trace it. Hey, is that your station wagon there at the side of the lunchroom? Why, yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I'd be glad to pay you if you drive me down to where I can no, get some No, 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 I, I can't. I, I can't leave here. Well, maybe your nephew could take me. Huh? The young fellow who was here this afternoon uh, when I came by. No, no, no. He, he's not familiar with the road. Oh, he drove down and picked up the mail this morning, didn't he? How'd you know? Jake, down at the barn grill. Have to mention it. Just who are you, anyway? Oh, I guess I did forget to introduce myself this afternoon. My name's Johnny Dollar, Mr. I not, uh, not your name. I mean, what are you up here for? Looking around, prospecting a little, seeing the country. Your nephew did go down for the mail, didn't he? But that was in the daylight. Look, you said you had a sleeping bag with you. It, it, it ain't cold tonight. Why don't you hey, just that's take a good it? idea. I can spread it out right there on the porch in front of your souvenir shop. No, no, I, I don't mean here. Down the road someplace. 
I, I don't quite understand your attitude, Mr. Bardell. I, I've always understood you Westerners were noted for your hospitality. Well, it, it's just that it, it, it makes the missus nervous to, to have strangers around outside. And how am I supposed to get down the road someplace? I, I don't know. On foot, maybe? In the dark? In a strange country? Oh, when I tell Jake this, he won't believe it. No. No what? No, don't, don't say anything to Jake. He, he wouldn't understand. Well, neither do I. I can't do anything for you, Mr. Dollar. Just take my word for it now and and, and go on before you cause more trouble and you What can... trouble, Uncle? What trouble are you talking about? Well, it, it's not trouble exactly. The, the lights is out on his car. He was just wanting me to put him up for the night. You have hard luck, don't you, mister? Hey, kind of looks that way. I told him just like I did this afternoon. We ain't got no place for him. He'll, he'll have to find somewhere. We can take care of him, Uncle, as long as he's that anxious to stay. But you said... I said what? The, the cabins, they're, they're all rented. And it's not likely the people of number two will be back. He can use that one for the night. But, but... You now... better go see if it's in shape, Uncle. Go on. All right. I, I'll go look at it. I'm, uh... Much obliged to you for changing his mind. That's okay. We wouldn't want you to go away and tell bad stories about us, would we? Might cause trouble. Expense account, item seven, five dollars. Payment in advance for one night's rent on cabin number two, Primrose Tourist Camp. The room and the bed were far from inviting, but it didn't matter much. I didn't look for any easy night's rest under the best of circumstances. Not with a feeling of tension and danger that hung over this place. And the almost certain knowledge that two desperate killers were only yards away from me. Mrs. Bardell, Pop's wife, took my payment for the room and made change in the lunchroom next door to the service station. I'll have to give you ones, Mr. Dollar. You've got a five-dollar bill. Oh, that's all right. There's two, three, four, and five. Want a receipt? No, no thanks. But I could sure stand something to eat. Well, I could... Cook you up some ham and eggs, I guess. Some coffee, if that'll do you. Sure, sure, fine. Only time I fix any regular meals, aside from short orders, when we got the cabins full. Then they're not full now, I take it, huh? No, not a soul. I, I mean, well, they're rented, of course, but the folks aren't eating here. Oh, I see. You want your eggs sunny side up? Yeah, yeah, that'll be fine. Must get kind of lonesome for you up here when the season slacks off. I got my man. And my daughter. How old is your daughter, Mrs. Bardell? Jenny was 20, month before last. Oh, well, I imagine she's a big help to you. Yes. She takes care of the souvenir shop on her own. Helps me here in the lunchroom when I get real busy. Yeah, I noticed a clothes sign on the door of the shop. Uh, is your daughter away at the present? No, she's... Um... Uh, she's not feeling well today. She's in her room. Oh, I hope it's nothing serious. No. She'll be all right. She's got to be. Then it is something serious. No. I I, I, I didn't mean it that way. It, it's nothing. Forget it. Well, look, if there's anything I can do... No, nothing. Forget I said anything, Mr. Dollar. You're going to want toast. Uh, no, bread will be fine. And there you are. Hope that's going to be enough for you. Yeah, plenty. Cream in your coffee? Black, please. Yeah. Ah, this looks great. You're a good cook, Mrs. Bardell. Ham and eggs don't prove nothing. Anybody can fix that. Oh, you'd be surprised. You'll be leaving in the morning, I suppose. Well, I'd like to stay several days, but I don't know whether your husband will let me have a cabin any longer. He can't help himself. He, he just can't help it. Why not? Well, he... The cabins are rented, that's all. When I put my stuff in number two, there was no sign of any other luggage. They, they took it all out. I was right there all the time, Mrs. Bardell. I mean earlier. Mr. Dollar, we're in terrible danger, all of us. You too. What kind of danger? I can't tell you. Please, if I talk about it, I'll go all to pieces. You don't know what it's like. I might be able to help you. If no. You... The only way you can help is to forget it, not ask any questions. This place is a powder keg. Don't do anything. Anything to set it off. Please, Mr. Dollar. Item 8, a dollar and ten cents, one order of ham and eggs. Mrs. Bardell refused to say anything more, and I didn't try to force her to. She was shaking, cold sweat on her forehead, scared half to death. 
I walked out onto the porch, sat down, lit a cigarette, watched the stars come out one by one, sharp and bright against the black mountain sky. The Barnell's living quarters were back at the souvenir shop, and there were no lights showing in them. If their daughter Jenny was in her room, ill, she was back there in the dark. After a while, I went to my cabin. As I fumbled around for a light switch, I suddenly realized somebody was standing in the doorway. Reckon you're going to have to use an oil lamp tonight, Mr. Dollar. Generator's got a drive belt busted, and I ain't been able to get out to fetch one. Oh, I don't mind, Mr. Barnell. The lamp's there on the table. I'll light it for you now, and you can blow it out when you go to bed. Sure. All right, fine. Uh, you had not to pay no attention to the missus, what she said a while ago. Oh, I didn't realize she'd said anything. Well, she was telling me she spouted off some foolishness. Might be tucked wrong if a man was to pay any mind to it. Uh, if that gets to smoking, you'll have to turn it down some. Okay. Mrs. Bardell did seem a little upset, but she well, didn't... Well, that's say... all it is, Mr. Dollar, just upset. You know how women get sometimes. Just forget it. It's the best thing to do. Anything you need now before I leave you? No, no, nothing I can think of. Thanks anyway. Then I reckon I'll say good night. You can have your breakfast in the morning any time after about 7 o'clock. Jake Meager was telling me you have a daughter, Mr. Bardell. That's right. I, uh... I, I didn't notice her around anywhere this evening. Is she, she, uh... she She's in uh, Tucson for a few days. Oh? Yeah, she's in there visiting friends. Oh, I see. Well, then, you're lucky to have your nephew here to help you while she's away. But... Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it works out real good. He's been here for some time, I suppose. Oh, yeah, yeah, several weeks now. Mm -hmm. Seems to be a lot of help to you. Really takes hold of things. Uh... I don't know what I'd do without him. Well, I'll see you in the morning. Mr. Bardell. Yeah? Jake Meager told me your nephew just came yesterday. Jake drinks too much. He's always getting things mixed up. And Mrs. Way. Bardell told me a little while ago that your daughter's out back in her room, ill, not in Tucson. Well, it's like I was saying. The missus is all upset. She, she just don't rightly know what she's saying. And one more thing. I noticed the front end of my car has been jacked up and the right front wheel's been taken off. The tire went flat. We'll fix it and put it back on in the morning. Good night, Mr. Dollar. Johnny Dollar. This is Jet Marsh, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, I've been waiting for you to call. The forest ranger come down to my cabin and said you was calling from one of the emergency phones. Figured it must be kind of important to... It is, Jed. I'm at the fire patrol phone a mile below Primrose Camp, the Summit Road. Can you meet me here? This time of night, four mile across the ridge on foot? Well, you're a woodsman, aren't you? That's what you told me this afternoon. Well, I didn't feel. I just met the Bardells. You're a longtime friend of theirs, aren't you? Something wrong at Pop's place? I think there's something badly wrong. He and his wife are scared half to death for some reason. I haven't seen the daughter, and Pop and his wife have each told me a different story about her. That don't sound like them at all. Well, they're obviously under some kind of pressure. That so-called nephew seems to be running the show. I told you, Pop ain't got no nephew. He has now, Jed. You got any idea what's behind it, Mr. Dollar? Yes. I think it's tied in with a $100,000 payroll robbery, that wrecked car we found this afternoon, three murders, and... You'd better meet me up here as soon as you can. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Primrose Camp, Arizona... To the Home Office, Mid-States Industrial Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Primrose Matter. Expense account continued. Jed Marsh, an old-time prospector, was a good friend of the Bardells, operators of the lonely tourist camp on a dead-end road high up in the Santa Rita Mountains. And I counted on that friendship to sway him. It did. He finally agreed to come. I hung up the Ranger Patrol phone and sat down on a flat pine stump to wait for him. And I hoped it wouldn't be too long a wait. The night wind sang for a cigarette and matches. Get your hands up! He was behind me and I couldn't see him. But I knew the voice. 
It was Pop Bardell's mysterious nephew. Get him up, move! You're up late. So are you. Now, just keep him there now. We'll see if you got it. Uh-huh. I figured you'd be packing a rod. Self-protection. I understand there are a lot of snakes around here. Maybe you understand too much, Dollar. I suppose you followed me from the camp. You're a good supposer. Now, what's the game? Well, I'm a bird watcher, and I specialize in observing the quaint habits of the night-flying titmouse. <laughs> I want jokes. I'll tell you I want jokes. I... I guess I misunderstood you. Right, get up. Get up. You're not hurt. Uh, I appreciate you telling me. I asked you a question, Dollar. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the game. You heard that phone conversation, didn't you? I heard it. And you know Who's about... Who's the guy you talked to? A friend of mine. An old prospector named Jed Marsh. I heard that. Why'd you get in touch with him? Well, now, he specializes in night-blooming uranium, so I thought we might combine our hobbies. Now, how much of this does it take to wise you up? Well, I, I, I think that one just might have done it. Why'd you want him to meet you here? I thought he might be useful. For what? For pointing out the roosting places of the night flying. All right, take it easy. Slap me once more with that rod and I may get mad. You're scaring me to death. There are worse ways to go. Dollar, them smart cracks are going to get you nothing but stitches. Stitches are what they're supposed to keep you Just on. keep asking. Relax, for... relax, relax. You know, I think I finally got you tagged. Now, what do you mean, tagged? You're not Pop Bardell's nephew and you don't come from Tulsa. Am I right so far? You're doing the talking. I think you came originally from Chicago or New York. But recently, you just come west from Kansas City. You a cop, Dollar? No. And how come you... I've been trying to place you ever since I saw you this afternoon. Thinking back over police bulletins I've seen, mug shots, descriptions. Yeah. You're a spade keller, aren't you? Go on. This is your story. You used to work with the Carzati mob. Then you went out of circulation for three years as a guest of the state. And when you got out, you apparently hooked up with Jipper Nitson and his gang. So you are a cop. Well, mister... I'm somebody who found that stolen car you ran off the cliff and tried to hide under a rock slide. If you found it, you must have been looking for it. I was looking for $100,000, that Kansas City payroll. The one you boys killed a couple of bank guards to get your hands on, remember? I'm just listening. Then, of course, you killed a state trooper down there at the highway when you crashed a roadblock. That's three murders, Spade. And nobody left now to pay for them but just you and the jipper. <laughs> you know, they got to catch us first. Oh, they will. Or kill you trying to. If the cops don't do no better than you did, the... Hey, Dollar. The cops know about that car? Which car is that, Spade? You know which car. The one we buried in the rock slide. There's the ranger phone. Call him up and ask him. Maybe they'll be happy... <laughs> you just keep it up, Dollar. This gun will still be in good shape when your head's got holes in it. I think maybe it's already happened. Now, what about it? You told the police about that car? You followed me, didn't you? You know I only made one call. Yeah, but you might have called him earlier. <sighs> Wouldn't that be kind of crazy? Then they'd get the hundred grand. You mean you... <sighs> so that's the game, huh? You and this pal of yours were figuring to knock us over and hijack that payroll for yourselves. I didn't say that. I figured you for a phony the minute you drove into the station this afternoon. That's why I had Bardell give you a cabin when you came back, and that's why I took a wheel off your car tonight. So I could have you or I could keep my good eye on you. See what you were up to. And now you think you know. Sure. You got a hunch we'd be holed up in here somewhere after we broke through that roadblock in the Nogales Highway. So you come up to snoop around and try to get your hands on that hundred thousand. Spade, you're a real smart boy. You found the car and then you tagged me. So you figured Primrose Camp for the hideout. How did the Bardells figure in it, Spade? And you sneaked down here tonight and phoned your pal, wanted him to come over to the camp and help you. Help you what, Dollar? You don't know where Jipper is, and you don't know where the money is. Now, what were you planning to do? I thought we might ask you. Yeah, I'll bet you did. Only it didn't work. No, it didn't work. Well, now there's nothing to do but just sit here and wait for your pal to show to make sure you wait quiet. So I waited quietly. Being somewhat unconscious, there wasn't much else I could do. I'd been trying to stall Spade until Jed Marsh arrived, hoping to tip Jed off in some way before he walked into the trap. But I'd been outfoxed, outmaneuvered, and finally just plain out. 
For how long, I don't know. But it was too long to do Jed any good. When I came to, he was already in the parlor and the spider had pounced. What do you mean, get my hands up? You heard me, didn't you? You done right, I heard you, but I... You ain't Mr. Dollar. What's going on here? Who the devil are you, anyhow? That you like a bullet right over your belt buckle. Now, you look here. Easy, Jed. Better do what he says. Mr. Dollar, what happened to you? The same thing that's going to happen to you if you don't get your hands up. What are you worried about, Spade? He's not even packing a gun. I suppose I make sure of that, huh? You're golden lucky I ain't got no gun, you shifty-eyed little sidewinder. Shut up. If I had one, I'd fill you so gall dang full of holes they would... You shoot me! You hurt Jen. Uh, not as bad as he'll be when I pay him back for that. Get over there next to Dollar. Come on, snap it up. Uh, I'm mighty glad there's a moon tonight. I want to get that face of yours real clear in my mind so as I'll know it next time I see it. So I, I told you to shut up. Better relax, Judd. Spade here is pretty jumpy. He's one of the last two left now, and he knows it's just a matter of time. What I gotta do, Dollar, smash that head of yours clear open? I think you'd better go easy on that slugging stuff, Spade. About the next time you swing on one of us, the other one's gonna jump you. I was wondering if you had the same idea I had, Mr. Dollar. Either one of you makes a move, it'll be your last one. You see, Jen, he's jumpy. He and the chipper are up at Dead End Road. They got no place to go from here, and Spade knows it. A couple more days, they'll figure we got clear away from this part of the country. They won't be looking for us around here. That's when we'll leave. And we'll get away with it. Provided Jed and I don't tell him where you are. You won't. That's one thing I'm real sure of. This here varmint wouldn't be aiming to drew us in, would he, Mr. Dollar? I wouldn't be surprised if he had something like that in mind, Jed. Am I right, Spade? What have I got to lose? That's a very logical attitude. What he means, Jed, is the fact that the gang has already murdered three people. And since they can only hang Spade and the Jipper once, a couple of more killings won't matter very much. Matter some to me, seeing as I'm the big one of them. Oh, yeah, and to me, seeing as I'm the other. But that's Spade's problem, of course. Having two of us on his hands. Even with him having the gun, it's pretty touchy business. Right, Spade? Get on your feet, Dollar. Sure. We'll stay as far apart as he'll stand for, Jed, so he'll have to swing the gun wide. Shut up, Dollar. If he goes for me first, jump him fast. Sure. I got you. Seen it happen once in Tonopah during a gold strike in nine. Shut up to both of you. Now, Spade's got an even worse problem, Jed. He's so scared and jumpy, he may even miss his first shot. Then he'll have both of us on him. You reckon I'd be jumpy, too, if I was standing there where he is. What are you talking about? Next to the edge of the cliff that way, close to all them boulders. What about them? Just snakes, that's all. Snakes? Oh, you shouldn't have told him, Jed. I was hoping he'd blunder onto one. Where's any snakes? Might be anywhere around you there. Along for sunup, when it starts getting chilly, they crawl in around the rocks and get warm. You city fellas ought to have a nurse to keep... Hey, hey, wait, wait a minute. I wouldn't move around much if I was you. Not without a flashlight. I haven't got a flashlight. Well, I have, right here in my pocket. Now, if I... Hold it! Keep your hands up. I've seen that trick pulled before. You throw the light in my eyes to give Dollar a chance to jump me. My, you've got a real suspicious nature, Spade. Snakes. There's probably no snakes within ten miles. What's that? Look out, Spade. Where? The other way. It's right there by your foot. Move back. Let me get the flash. I can't see what I'm... Not that way, Spade. You're going to step on it. No, no. Jump back, jump back. Which way? Look out, the cliff. You're going on the end. He stepped back on that loose slab on the edge, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. Well, it was sure his last step, Jed. That must be a 400-foot drop there. I didn't aim for this to happen. I was just trying to upset him so as we could jump him. How'd you make that noise, anyway? With this? A set of old timber snake rattles stuck on a pine sliver. You just rub your thumb on it, and it starts them going. Use it sometimes to spook a tenderfoot. Are you sure spook one tonight? Can't say I'm too sorry at that, Mr. Dollar. He wasn't aiming no good for us, and that's for dang sure. Three down now. Only the jipper himself is left. Funny about life sometimes, Mr. Dollar. That spade fellow went around striking out at people like a snake does. And he died the same darn way. All smashed on the rocks. Just like a snake dies... Johnny Dollar. This is Cal Mervin 
State Police. Well, Lieutenant, they found you in a hurry. Sure, I was home in bed where any decent person would be this hour of the night or morning or whatever it is. You'll get no sympathy from me. I haven't even been to bed. What are you doing, Dollar? Living in a tree up there and using that Forest Service phone for your own private exchange? More or less. I've got another body for you, Lieutenant. That's a happy good morning. Who's this one? An ex-Chicago hood named Spade Keller. What did you do, kill him? No, he fell over a cliff, in a manner of speaking. That's three of the gang dead now. The only one left is Jipper Nitsen himself. Have you found him yet? No, but I think I will in the next hour or so. Dollar, I can't hold my men out of there any longer. I gotta move in. Give me till noon, Lieutenant. If I can take him myself, it may save an innocent person's life. He's a three-time killer already. I know, and you've been selling me that story for the last 12 hours. That's what's held me back. But I've got to have more details. All right. A friend who's with me, a prospector named Jed Marsh, will meet you here at the Forest Service phone in an hour. He'll be in a green station wagon. When did you get a hold of a green station wagon? We haven't yet. We're about to steal it. So long, Lieutenant. Tonight... And every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Primrose Camp, Santa Rita National Forest, Arizona... To the Home Office, Mid-States Industrial Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Primrose Matter. Expense account, final page. The Jibber Nitsen gang had held up an armored truck in Kansas City, killed two guards, and fled with a $100,000 payroll covered by insurance. I'd finally tracked them down in the Santa Rita Mountains of Southern Arizona. Three of the gang were dead now, and only the jipper himself was still unaccounted for. But he was close around, that I was sure of, somewhere near the Primrose Tourist Camp where I was staying. A lonely layout on a dead-end mountain road run by old Pop Bardell and his wife, and their daughter Jenny, whom I still hadn't seen. It was nearly dawn when Jed Marsh and I got back to the camp. There was no sign of life. We'd taken the keys to Pop's station wagon from the dead gangster's pocket. Jed got into the station wagon and waited until I was over at the cabin, then started the motor. I was counting on the sound of the motor to bring somebody out into the open. And the plan worked. Partly. But it wasn't the jibber who showed. It was Pop Ardell. Pete! What are you doing? Where are you going? He came running out of the living quarters behind the souvenir shop, tugging at his suspenders. Come back here! He didn't notice me until I walked up behind him. What the devil? What are you doing up? I'm an early riser. Anything wrong, Mr. Bardell? Wrong? Why, no. What do you think be wrong? I don't know. But I thought you seemed a little upset about something. Well, I was just... Did you happen to notice who was driving my station wagon, Mr. Dollar? I can't say I particularly noticed. I imagine it was your nephew, wasn't it? I don't know. I didn't get out in time to see. Well, who else would it be? Your daughter, you told me, is in Tucson. There's nobody else here, is there? Except you and your wife? No, no, nobody else, huh? I just thought maybe I... I reckon it was him, all right. He don't seem to be around. Is he in the habit of taking your car without telling you, Mr. Bardell? No, of course not. He must have just gone after something. He'll be back in a little while. You know, it seems funny him having the keys to it. He's kind of taken over your place here, hasn't he? What do you mean? Well, taking your car the way he just did. And yesterday evening, when I wanted to rent a cabin for the night, you claimed they were all full, weren't going to let me have one until he stepped in and okayed it. Well, he's, he's my nephew, one of the family. Somehow, though, I can't quite picture you as a man who'd let any other member of his family run things. Unless, of course, you happen to be in a position where you had no choice. What are you talking about? I think you know. Well, of course I got a choice. Why wouldn't I have? Not one, though, that you'd probably care to make if I've got the setup here tagged right. You ain't no tourist, Dollar, and you ain't here looking for uranium. Who are you, anyhow? I'm a special investigator for an insurance company, the company that insured that $100,000 payroll that was stolen in Kansas City by Jipper Nitsen and his gang. What's that got to do with anything here at Primrose? Quite a bit, Mr. Bardell, because this is where the gang hold up. The two of them who were left after they shot their way through that roadblock down on the Nogales Highway. You, you're crazy. I'd know it if, if there was any strangers around here. You did know it. 
One of the two was the man you claim was your nephew. Now, now wait a minute. Actually, he was a gangster by the name of Spade Keller. He's dead, by the way. He's dead? Yeah, that's right. It wasn't he that took your station wagon. It was a friend of yours, Jed Marsh. Jed? Why? What's he aiming to do? Meet the police on the road down below, tell them what the setup is here, and stall them off if he can. Long enough for me to have a try at taking Nitsen without giving him a chance to hurt your daughter. What do you mean by that? Last night, your wife told me Jenny was in a room ill. You said she was in Tucson. One thing's sure, she wasn't around here anywhere. Neither was Jipper. I think he's been holding her as a hostage to keep you and your wife in line. That's why you had to let Spade Keller pass himself off as your nephew. No, 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 that ain't true. You're out of your mind. Am I? Jenny's in, in Tucson, like I told you. Your wife said she was here. Oh, she was upset. Sure she all. was. Sure she was, because of the danger to her daughter, the same reason that's got you upset. No, it ain't true. She'll have a lot better chance if you cooperate with me. Please get out of here, Dollar. Leave us alone. It wouldn't change things if I did. The police are going to move in at noon with 50 men and start a search... Chip is a three-time killer already. One more won't matter to him. I can't help you. Please don't ask me to. He'll use her as a hostage, a shield, and try to shoot his way out. She won't have a chance. Ooh. Your best hope is to tell me where he is. Help me get to him without arousing a suspicion. I can't do it. I can't take the chance. Yes, you can. Myra. Morning, Mrs. Mardell. He's a special investigator, Myra. He knows the whole thing. He, he says... Yes, he... I've been listening. I heard what he said. And he's right, too. Myra, that fella Nitson said if we were I so I know much what as... he said. If we breathed one word of him being here to anybody, he'd kill Jenny first and then us. And I heard what Mr. Dollar just said, too. And he's right. we got to take the chance for Jenny's sake. It's all we can do now. I don't know. I, I just don't know. With the police coming in like they are, it's out of our hands now. She's right, Mr. Bardell. You can't do anything about the inevitable. It's a matter now of doing what's best and safest for your daughter. What else do you suppose I've been thinking of for two days? It's still the only thing to think of. If I didn't agree with you, I wouldn't be here. I'd turn my information over to the police and let them go ahead and search the area. They'd get Nitsen all right, but not before he killed her. Oh, no. But I think I can prevent that. The chipper doesn't know me. As far as he's concerned, I'm just another eastern tourist wandering around the mountains here. And because of that, I think I can get a lot closer to him than the police can without putting him on guard. Provided you'll help. He's right. We gotta do what he says. He's holed up in an old tunnel about a quarter mile back up the canyon there. They took some silver out in the old days. Not many folks even know about it. And your daughter's there with him? Yes, sir. Mo and me's been taking food to him twice today, making sure she's all right. And she has been. I guess he knowed that's the only hold he had over us. You haven't been there yet this morning, have you? No, he don't expect us for around ten. Well, maybe by that time, if things go all right, he'll have more to worry about than whether he gets his breakfast or not. What are you aiming to do, Mr. Dollar? Make an early morning prospecting trip up that canyon. I'll take a pick, a Geiger counter, anything to help look the part. Now, here, I'll leave my gun with you, Mr. Bardell, and my wallet. You're going up there without no gun? Sunday prospectors from the east don't carry them. Wish me luck. I left a little while later with a complete kit and dressed to fit the part, even including a couple of sandwiches and a canteen of water to show I was planning to spend a full day in the hills. At the end of an hour, I was working my way down the canyon, shipping rock samples here and there, testing with a Geiger counter, apparently without a care in the world. The brush-covered entrance to the tunnel was only a few yards ahead of me, but I made a point of deliberately ignoring it. Finally, the mouth of the tunnel was only a few feet away. I pushed aside the brush as though to get at the canyon wall, then pretended to see the tunnel for the first time. I pushed aside some more brush, and I stepped inside. After a moment's hesitation, I fished out my flashlight and started walking back in from the entrance. I hadn't gone far before I got results. Oh. I went out like a light. You didn't have to hit him. He's just some prospector who stumbled in here accidentally. Relax, kid. He's just knocked out. You didn't have to hit him like that. I can't afford to take chances. I'm going out the entrance to make sure he was alone. If he comes to you, call me. The blow had been sharp, but without much force. I was out only for a matter of seconds, but I went on playing possum. I waited now until he was out of earshot. Jenny. You're conscious. You know my name. Just take it easy. I don't want him to hear us. Who are you? What are you... Never mind. There's no time. Just don't worry. I'm here to get you out of this. 
But how? He's a killer. A gangster. I know who he is. Look, has he got that money here with him? That he stole in Kansas City? Yeah. Yeah, I'd send some canvas sacks back inside the tunnel, Father. What difference does that make? Plenty. That's what I was hired to recover. Hired to... I don't understand Oh, well, you. I'll tell you later. Now, if you'll keep your head and give me a little help, we've got a good chance Wait. of getting you... Wait. He's coming back. All right, listen. Maneuver him four or five yards away from me with his back turned and keep him that way for just five seconds. I'll do the rest. Got it? Yeah, but I don't know if Never I can. Never mind the if. Just do it. All right. Don't let him know I'm conscious. A guy still out? Yeah, I, I think maybe he's dying. Then let him. Come on, get away from him, leave him alone. It's inhuman to treat anybody that way. Oh, shut up, I got problems of my own. How much longer are you gonna keep me here? I get a hunch that something is wrong. Things just don't feel right this morning. If I thought this guy had something to do with Chipper, it, I'd... I asked you how much longer... And I said shut up! How'd you like to make me shut up? Huh? How do you mean that? Suppose you come here and find out. Well, now. Took you two days, but you're finally starting to soften up. My huh? hand closed over a rock <laughs> almost as big as a baseball, weighing over half a pound. And I came slowly to my feet. Chipper whirled around, going for his gun. Hey, what's the devil? What? I aimed for his head. <laughs> All right, Jenny. He can pick up his gun. But look how he's bleeding. You've killed him. No. No, I haven't killed him. But I imagine the state will. <laughs> Expense account item 12, $309.45. Incidentals in Arizona and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $914.15. Remarks? The state eventually did. Kill him, I mean. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Ever chase a phantom? Well, believe me, I have. And I will next week in the Phantom Chase Matter. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Marvin Miller, Junius Matthews, Herb Ellis, D.J. Thompson, Herb Butterfield, Tony Barrett, and Barbara Eiler. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>